Our scripture today is, both scriptures are taken from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and chapter 10, verses 1 through 48. So hang on. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come unto you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with, with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him, and after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. <clears throat> the next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and, falling at his feet, worshipped him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with them, he went in and found that many had assembled. He said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, four days ago at this very hour, at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who's called Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner by the sea. Therefore, I, I send for you immediately and you've been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. Then Peter began to speak to them. 
I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is, what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Gal Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit, and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still t speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Good morning, church. I recognize that we are in a Church of the Brethren in the United States and not in an African congregation. Because if we were in Africa, all the front seats would be full and the back seats would be empty. So this is kind of a mixture. I also want to thank you very much for returning and to uh, suggest that you have a great, great stamina for stories. Because when you invite missionaries to come and tell stories, you never know when it's going to finish. If you were here last week, you know that we did a travel log of our missionary experiences. Today, we would like to focus more on the principles that we learned about mission along our way. From the title of the sermon, you can deduce that the Holy Spirit and our colleagues were our primary instructors. But let me give you a word of caution before we go into the principles. These principles that we're going to share with you today are things that worked for us in Africa. So you may need to adapt them, or you may need to discover your own. Please do not take them as holy writ, but try to apply them to your situation. Some may actually work for you, but it is really important that you articulate and discover the principles that work for Sedgwick County, Kansas. The first principle that I'd like to share is, it's very important to focus on those to be served and not on to yourselves. You'll recall that the idea of mission comes from the Latin word missio, which means to be sent. So it's very, very crucial to know who your target population is. When we went to Sudan, we were sent to serve the people of Western Upper Nile province. The target people thus were very well defined. One of the things that we needed to do was to find out what the felt needs of this target population was. So a group of people from the Sudan Council of Churches and the Christian Medical Commission of the World Council of Churches sent some people in and spent nearly a month going through the area talking to people to find out what their felt needs were. They came up with four different things. Water, human health, animal health, and food production. 
So when we got there and we began to gather staff together, we said we better check to make sure that these four things were exactly correct. So we spent nearly 18 months recruiting staff and detailing these assessment surveys of the area. The conclusion that we came to was that the needs were water, human health, animal health, and food production. Great, we are all united in what we understood to be their felt needs. So we recruited a hydrologist. But when Steve arrived, very little happened. We tried multiple approaches to make it effective, and it just didn't work. One day, Chief Luke, who happened to be our neighbor, came and said, you need to vaccinate the cows. But I said, Luke, we went through all this nearly two years of checking and making sure, and vaccinating the cows was number three, not number one. And then Luke said, but Roger, you said we're the ones to set the agenda. Yeah, that's true. But since we did that survey and we all agreed, how can you say vaccinate the cows? If you want to help us, you must vaccinate the cows. Well, if we vaccinate the cows, will you pay for the vaccines? Because we had the principle that we would do only for them what they couldn't do for themselves. Yes, we'll pay whatever it takes for the vaccination of the cows. So I went and got some Rinderpest vaccine, vaccine, which is what we need to vaccinate the cows with, and negotiated with the veterinary services of the government, and we started vaccinating cows. When we reached 130,000 cows, Luke came back and said, now you can start on the water. I, I don't understand. Luke said, now that you have done what we ask, we know we can trust you. You have earned trust. Americans tend to think of trust as being something automatic. Trust is not automatic. It comes as it's earned. Now that you vaccinated those cows, you can do the water. Mission is about relationships. The most carefully crafted surveys, those assessment tools that you may use, all those things are not nearly as important as trust. To be successful at any kind of mission endeavor, relationships must developed, be developed to the point where the people can trust each other. The next principle that we want to talk about is discover what God is already doing. Am I on? The New Air people that we lived among in the early 1980s were very spiritual people. They believed in spirits, good spirits, and evil spirits. <coughs> Once Raj was asked to cast out an evil spirit from our gardener. They believed that a person's spirit upon the death of that person would be lifted to heaven by the fishing eagle. After death, any death, they watched for the flight of the eagle that had come to carry that spirit of that person to heaven. And they would see it, and they would declare that the eagle had come. It seemed like they had been highly influenced in the long ago past by the Jewish people, the Jewish religion. They believed in a supreme God, which they called Quoth. They believed that you didn't want to make God angry. They followed the regulations of leveret marriage, where a man was to take the wife of his dead brother and father children with that wife on behalf of the dead brother. They believed that God created man from earth, from the dirt, like the Genesis story. Religion was a daily part of their life. One day, an old respected man of the tribe came to Roger to talk. 
This elder praised Roger for being a good missionary. He had brought the vaccines to the area for the health of the cattle, and he had brought the story of Jesus. This story seemed to this elder to complete the story of God that their people understood in their traditions. Jesus was the capstone to the relationship of God that the people already knew. This all felt good. And then he said to Roger, have you ever thought that it's possible that God may have been here before you came? And so it is in your search for your congregation's mission, God is already present in Wichita. Each of the places and ways that he is, search for the places and the ways that he is already at work. Find your place in that work and take it up. This will take much prayer and discernment on your part. It will take a willingness to listen and be open to the leading of the Spirit. Another principle that we had to learn, and I want to be sure that you learn as well, be sure that you focus on Christianity and not just culture. When we went to Nigeria, we went thinking that we, what we were doing was to transform persons from their traditional ways of religion to becoming a Christian. Early in our career as missionaries, we learned that things that the earlier missionaries had done, which we were quite critical of. An example would be that when the early men in Nigeria became Christians and they wanted to attend communion, they had a dilemma. The problem was that the missionary said you could not take communion if you had more than one wife. So this man said, now what am I to do? Because if I get rid of one of my wives, I've divorced and then I can't take communion again. I'm stuck between the dog and the tree. So what the Nigerians figured out was if they would put one wife just outside the gate, outside their fence, then she wasn't really officially a wife and so he could attend. Of course, it was not a problem for the woman because each woman had only one husband. And we thought, my goodness, where in Jesus' teaching does it say you can have only one wife? The Old Testament, we have many stories of men having more than one wife. But then we began to realize that we may even need to examine what we were doing as well. Is what we are coming with really the teachings of Jesus, or is it also a bunch of cultural baggage? It was interesting that by the time we got there and the Nigerians became the leaders of the church, they made the decision the issue was not whether you had more than one wife. If you had more than one wife when you became a Christian, you're welcome to come to communion. But you were not to take a, an additional wife. So they had a very different approach. But it was a cultural approach that was much more effective for their area than what we brought as coming from the United States. <clears throat> if one is in the business of transforming people's lives to make them Christians, and I'm assuming that's what you're thinking about when you go out to be missionaries, be very, very sure that you're inviting them to truly become followers of Jesus and not seekers after cultural principles. Let me say it again. Be sure that they're becoming followers of Jesus and not seekers of cultural principles. Let me use a personal example. My grandmother did not believe that one could drink a beer and uh, be a Christian. No way. But then when I got to McPherson College, I realized that Jesus changed water into wine. Does that mean you can drink wine but not beer? No. Alcoholic abstinence is not a necessity for being a follower of Jesus. A non-drinker can be a follower of Jesus. Check your expectations. 
Check your mores. Check your values to be sure that they conform to Jesus' teachings and not to what grandma taught you or what the culture teaches you. Let me suggest that there is an example which you may need to carefully examine as you move forward. And that's the time of your worship service. It's not because we have to drive down from McPherson. But if we were gathering in Khartoum, Sudan, you would be thinking about Friday afternoon or Friday evening. Because in that society, it's a Muslim culture. And Friday afternoon is the day of prayers. And so the Christians gather on Friday afternoon or Friday evening for their prayers. Maybe you need to think about multiple times of worship. What are the times that will need, meet the needs of young working families? Might it be Saturday night? Some other night of the week? Or must it be Sunday morning that meets the needs and expectations of old geezers like me? The church in Nigeria, which we call EYN, has examples of outreach that I would like to share with you. On June 2nd, Pastor Allen gave a very good sermon on breathing. I watched it on YouTube. <laughs> and he suggested that your congregation needs to be practicing breathing in and breathing out. And I agreed with him. Another way to say it is coming in and going out. In our experience in the Nigerian church, EYN, we found a practice that they had been doing for years and years. And as a consequence, they had grown to be a very large denomination in their own right. They practiced and still are practicing going out. They do this in at least two ways. First, a congregation does not exist until it has five preaching points. This means that they have five places away from their home spot where they go and teach classes and have worship services. They call these places preaching points. When this is successfully in place in five different locations, away from the base group, this base group then can apply to be a congregation. How do they do that? Well, they send one or two of their own out to a neighboring village or a cluster of homes to set up this preaching point. It may start as Bible teaching once a week, like on a Saturday afternoon. And it will likely start with just two or three people who are listening to this Bible teaching. As word spreads that the teacher has come this Saturday afternoon and more and more people gather to hear, it becomes a place for teaching about Jesus to occur at that preaching point. The home-based group sends out another <coughs> person to a different location to do this teaching and to build up the number of folk who are hearing the good news of Jesus. When these preaching points are firmly in place, the base group requ requests to be recognized. In a very heavily populated place, a preaching point can eventually send out others from that preaching point and establish more preaching points, and then they can become a congregation. What would preaching points look like in Wichita? Well, maybe they would be seen as small groups meeting in homes, teaching about Jesus, and ministering to those in attendance. Alan gave some history of this congregation in his former sermon. Actually, this congregation has in the past done similar things. Maybe you need to consider doing that again. But the key principle is that the meetings 
often um, offer something that the people need to hear, something that they are longing for and missing in their life. A second way that the EYN church reaches out or breathes out is through their women's groups. All over the EYN area, local congregations form a women's fellowship group. This church probably has had in the past, if you don't already, at least, they have, you have had them. These women's groups meet together on a given afternoon, let's say Thursday afternoon, something that is convenient for the women after they have worked all hard all day uh, with food preparation and doing the laundry of the family and cleaning this compound, then they have time to come together and to fellowship and to pray. And then they go out to visit a woman in the community that needs help. As they go, they all wear the same cloth. You've probably seen the Nigerian women in their bright colored cloths with their heads tied up. Well, they go out wearing the same cloth, the same dress. And they become known in the community by their look. Oh, that's the church women. And they sing songs along the walk as they go to this other woman's home. And they are known for the sound that they are coming. We would call this branding. Maybe the need that they're going to see is that the woman is ill. Or that maybe there's a new baby been born and they need to help her celebrate the birth of her child. Or maybe she's lost her husband. They go out as a group to minister and to rejoice with that woman. The woman will be invited to come to church on Sunday morning and hopefully will eventually be drawn into the women's fellowship group. This is an ex excellent example of going out and coming in, giving personal attention to a woman in emotional, spiritual, or social need. One other principle that I want to point out from this example is that these women are visible. Is your congregation visible in your community or your targeted community? Do you come to church on a Sunday morning, go inside, maybe seeming secretly to those who might be watching from across the street, and then emerge and leave? Have you exposed yourself and become visible to the neighborhood? Have you had activities like picnics or games or singing outside that can be seen by others? How about a vacation Bible school in the parking lot or on the grassy yard so that it can be seen? Invite the neighborhood before you hold this Bible school so that they know that they are also welcome. How about summer evening movies outside? Is language an issue? Rely on those who speak Spanish or whatever language is needed to be an auditory part of these activities. Be visible and be heard, either on this property or whatever area you target. Build relationships. Another learning that we gathered while in Africa was that persons' gifts are greater than their roles. Last summer when Carolyn and I spent three months in South Sudan working with the Brethren Work in Tarit, South Sudan, we attended the Africa Inland Church. Very soon after our arrival, I was asked to preach. Since they had been preaching out of the book of Acts, I chose to continue that process. But one of the surprising events was that Carolyn was also asked to preach. Those who know Carolyn would not find that surprising, but we were just not quite sure if the Africa Inland Church would agree for women to preach the word because they're out of a patriarchal society and women are expected to be quiet and the men take the lead. She accepted the request 
and she preached such a good sermon that she was asked to preach again. I was never asked to preach again. <laughs> Another exciting experience we witnessed while we were living in South Sudan during the time of the war was that some new hymns appeared. There was a woman who had no musical training. She was very, very poorly educated. She composed over 100 new hymns by herself. Mary from Boer used the gifts that God had given her, not the roles that the men in the church expected her to do, but the gifts that God offered to her. The point from these stories is that one needs to realize that the gifts which God provides are much, much greater than gender or cultural expectations. You need to think about that when you start in doing more of your mission work. Do not limit your thinking to the commonplace or to the proverbial box that we talk about. Let it be outside the box. Those out of the box experiences can be wonderful God events. We learn to accept blessing from strangers. This turned out to be a provision from God. Let me tell you one story from our time in Mayum. We lived in a very remote place, 70 miles from the next town where you could buy supplies, things like food, fuel, cloth, and so on. And even in that town, supplies were available only about half of the year, during the dry season, when the roads were open and the trucks could come in from the capital city bringing these supplies. So at the end of the dry season, and there were good supplies in the shops, we laid in supplies, uh, Enough, we thought, to last the six months until the roads would open again, and once again, we could travel and purchase things. <coughs> As the rainy season came and we were bound to our village, we had a few jars of jam, tea leaves, some canned fruit, dried yeast, a couple of big bags, 100 kilo bags of flour, maybe a 100 kilo bag of sugar, a fair amount of salt, and two big tins, tins like this, full of cooking oil. We hunted for meat in the bush. We raised a few hens for eggs. And I baked bread twice a week. As the rainy season wore on, the flour and sugar went down and down. The first bag of flour finished, and then the second one went close to the bottom. Finally, as I dipped out flour one day, I look, it looked like I could maybe bake about two or three more times, and then the flour would be gone. I prayed in desperation, Lord, how will I feed my family when the flour is gone? <coughs> it was typical for folk in this area to come by our house to greet us and to see this strange white family. Also, tradition for them was to bring a gift, expecting a gift in return as they left. Their hope was that we would share some sugar with them for their tea, and consequently, our sugar bag also got very close to being finished. <coughs> On a day when I was praying, what can I cook today? A visitor appeared with a small amount of guap. What was a homegrown sorghum soaked in water and ground between two stones, making a paste of the grain. This paste could then be thinned down and boiled to make mush. The amount that was brought was about the right amount to feed our family of four for one meal. Thank you, God for sending an unknown woman with a gift that we desperately needed. How great our God is. Thus we learned to trust God with the unknown. 
and to be grateful for his provision in whatever form it appeared. As you search for the will of God in your mission, there will be answers provided from above. But the answer may not look like what you were expecting. It might be guap instead of bread. <laughs> Don't limit God with your own ideas of what is good and doable. Be open to see outside your box. You of the Wichita Church must place your trust in God to provide for those unknowns that you do not know how to solve. You don't need all the answers from yourself if you learn to trust the Lord for answers. And then be open to recognizing and receiving those answers when they come. If you've had the opportunity to read the back of your bulletin, or you will when you go home, it talks about spiritual interference. Pray for the spirit to boldly interfere with you. Let me remind you that these principles which we learned, some of them the hard way, some of them very easily, but all things that we needed to learn, we found they worked for us as they applied to our situation in Africa. Some may work for you here in Sedgwick County. But I'm suspecting that you will need to make some major adaptations. Whatever the case, please be careful to analyze and do what you collectively sense the Spirit asking you to do. The scriptures that were read this morning provide a very good basis for you to adopt as key principles for your mission foci. The Acts 1 text suggests that you start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. Let me paraphrase that by <laughs> suggesting start with what you understand to be home, Next, go to your neighbors. And finally, go beyond what seems comfortable or even feasible. The context for this Acts passage is written from the perspective of the Jews. So it starts by saying, with our people, go to those who have a shared history, the Samaritans, but those who are different from us. And finally, don't be afraid to go to those who are even strangers. Think of that carefully as you begin to see what God might be calling you to do. <coughs> then the second passage from Acts, the dream of Peter, is seldom thought of as a missional text. But I'd like to suggest it may be a seminal text for you, for us as brethren. Peter starts from a long history who's a proud Jewish man of that Jewish history. In that history, in that tradition, it is clear that you, as a good Jewish boy, will never eat something that's unclean. My goodness, no. In that tradition, it is clear who was in and what is theologically correct. But when Peter is confronted by this dream of God's spirit, his understanding about good religion is transformed. He learns that the practice of judgment, which he's been taught as a boy, which was to bring about his sense of being pure, was not God-ordained. For everything that God has made is good. I would suggest that it's our role to celebrate what God has created, and it is not our role to stand in judgment. As brethren, we are proud of our Anabaptist heritage, but it is easy to become judgmental in our discernment as we go about our actions. We conduct our worship and our fellowship times in English, 
because that's the language we feel most comfortable with. How many of you have learned French to speak with your Congolese family? Do you realize that forcing them to speak your language is cultural chauvinism? If you really, really want to speak with another person, speak in their language. We had to learn that in Africa. And I would suggest it's something we need to learn here in Wichita and certainly in the United States. The expectations that others will look and act like us if they become followers of Jesus is either cultural or ethnic chauvinism. The wonderful diversity of God's creation means that we need to be seekers to learn from others what God may be sharing with them. When that old man said to me, is it possible God may have been here before you? Maybe you need to also check to see what God is telling those you think you need to transform. Maybe they have a message for you as well. If you can internalize this experience of Peter's, you will have some amazing insights and stories to share with Western Plains District, the Church of the Brethren, and yes, our ecumenical brothers and sisters around the world. So let me say to Coase, Godspeed in your missional journey. Carolyn and I would love to receive periodic reports as you live out your missional journey. May you dare to follow where God wants you to go. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from the First Church of the Brethren in Wichita, Kansas. If you'd like to watch another video, click the link on the right. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video. And we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at 9.30 for Sunday school and 10.45 for worship. Everyone is welcome and you're invited.